Thank you for coming tonight as we continue in Proverbs, a book of wisdom, a book of poetry, really. There's five books of poetry. It's beautiful. It's not the poetry that maybe you and I grew up on in grammar school, you know, the rhymes, and, but it's beautiful poetry and prose, isn't it? It's written. We need to speak more prose and poetry, I think. I think it's, it's a beautiful language. It's a beautiful, it's, it's just chock full of metaphors and imagery and illustrations. And, and this is who our God is. He's such a creative God. He's created us. We are his workmanship, Paul told us in Ephesians. Created for good works. Created for beautiful and wondrous things. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard the wonders that he has for us as we submit and commit our lives to him. So as we continue in Proverbs, I wanted to kind of look at a few Proverbs maybe we've gone over early on, but here's one that grabbed my attention right from the beginning from Proverbs 120. Wisdom shouts in the streets. She cries out in the public square. Wisdom cries out in the streets. She cries out in the public squares. Some versions say in the marketplace. But are we hearing God's wisdom? There's a lot of messages out there. There's a lot of noise out there, isn't there? And it all wants our attention. It demands our attention. It demands for us to make a response. But are we hearing? Are we tuning in our ears to hear the voice of our good shepherd? And that's what this book of wisdom, this book of poetry is all about, is hearing God's voice in all of this. Hearing the voice of wisdom, which is found in Christ, Colossians 2.3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In whom are hidden all the treasures. We need to dig. We need to be miners, don't we? We need to be miners for a heart of gold. Sounds like an old rock and roll song, doesn't it? But it's true. We need to mine the nuggets of truth that are found in Christ. They're treasures waiting for us to discover and open up, revealing his love and his grace. The unsearchable riches of his grace, Paul writes in Ephesians. The unsearchable riches of his grace, the unsearchable riches of his mercy, the unsearchable riches of his love for us. Proverbs 2.2, my child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom, making your ear attentive to what wisdom, making your ear attentive to wisdom and incline your heart to understanding. My child. So this was written early in Solomon's life, and we're going to look at later in Solomon's life, which didn't end so well, began well, didn't end well. We see that one of those last books, Ecclesiastes, he writes, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Wow. It's like, is that it, Solomon? The wisest man the world has ever known, is this it? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Well, there's some truth to that, isn't there? If we're not keeping our eyes fixed on the cross, if we're not keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, then all is vain, isn't it? It's all sinking sand. David in Psalm 46 wrote, In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. You have given me an open ear. In Hebrew, the psalm reads, and I really like this, Ears you have dug for me. Ears you have dug for me. What are we hearing? We can't sometimes, can we? We need a pickaxe. We need an ice pick. I know I do. My wife will say, didn't you hear what I said? Aren't you listening to me? So I can relate to that. I can relate to ears you have dug for me. I think oftentimes I need the Lord 
to take that pickaxe, to take that ice pick to my ears and open the eyes of my heart, open the ears that I can hear his voice. Ears you have dug, I can relate to that. The prophet Jeremiah wrote, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that smashes a rock, Jeremiah 23, 29. Like a hammer that smashes a rock. Yes, Lord, set our hearts aflame. Crack open our hard hearts. The disciples on the Aeneas Rose said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us when he opened up the scriptures? And so, Heavenly Father, we come before you. Open the eyes of our heart as we sing. Open our ears to hear your voice. Turn our eyes to see your face. Be glorified, be magnified, be amplified in our lives tonight. We want to hear your voice in all of this, Lord. There is so much noise out there. There is so much that wants our attention. We want to hear you, the voice of our good shepherd. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as we began the series on Proverbs, Brad, in his introduction, made a comment that has stayed with me. He said, ingesting the word is what makes us wise. Ingesting the word is what makes us wise. By applying the word is what makes us wise. Ingesting the word, feasting on the word. Your word is my delight, the psalmist wrote. Ingesting, taking it in. Digesting his word, absorbing God's word so it becomes a very fiber of our beings. So it becomes who we are, this new identity this new way to be human, walking in God's love, walking in his truth, walking in his light. Let me share a couple of brief scriptures on taking God's word in and ingesting it because it's not, it's not out of the realm of possibility what we're called to do. This is from the Living Bible, Proverbs 3.18. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who set her... Wisdom is a tree of life to those who eat her fruit... Happy is the man who keeps on eating it. (laughs) Happy is the man who keeps on eating it. Don't you just love summer fruit this time of year? Peaches, nectarines. There's a mulberry tree down the street from where we live, and I so much enjoyed early summer going down with the grandkids and climbing up in the mulberry tree and pulling off the sticky, sweet mulberry fruit. How happy is the man that can feast and enjoy the, the riches of God's fruit in our life. In Ezekiel 3.1, the Lord spoke to the prophet Ezekiel and said, eat the scroll. Hmm? Eat the scroll. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly with the scroll that I give you and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it. And it was, as, it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. Ezekiel 3, verses 1 through 3. Revelation 10, we read where John saw a mighty angel coming down from heaven with an open scroll in his hand. Verse 8, then a voice from heaven spoke to John saying, go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel. Take it and eat it. Eating the word of God, feasting on the word of God. Are we doing that? These guys have mentioned that the topic for tonight is going to be marriage. And I, I come into this with fear and trembling. We've been married 40 years. You would think that I would have this down, that I would feel very comfortable on this topic. But I know, I know that I'm shaking in my boots. And I know the only message that I can have is if I'm ingesting his fruit, his word, his life into my very being. If we're not ingesting his word, if we're not absorbing his word, then we really don't have a message, do we? Do we? Oh, we can sit down and go through, you know, different commentaries and different websites that have Sermon Central, whatever is on it, and we can put together a, a reasonable 30, 40 minute message, can't we? It would be acceptable. But is that what God wants from you and me as we're meeting people in the marketplace, as we're trying to override what's being shouted to them? We want to be able to be able to share God's wisdom. And we're not going to be able to share God's wisdom unless we're living God's wisdom, right? In other words, God's truth must be experienced personally, chewed on, digested before it becomes real, before it becomes complete in our own lives. 
I think that's what happened to the, the people of Israel. Really. I think they had a message. They had covenants. They had priests. They had a temple. They had circumcision, for goodness sake. But then what happened? They kind of lost their message. They became very pharisaical, didn't they? Became very legalistic, very dogmatic, very judgmental, very critical. They had a critical spirit. Oh, I pray that we wouldn't, church, have a critical spirit, that we would not be judgmental, that we would have a message of love and joy and peace, that we would bear fruit of the spirit, not the works of the flesh. There's that contrast, isn't there? There's always that tension and contrast through God's word. But we need to have a message of love and peace and joy that can really only come through absorbing God's word, living God's word, taking in God's word, eating his word, feasting on his word. Are we doing that? I, I'm, just as, I'm just as guilty, especially come you know, September NFL season or come April with MLB season, um, all-star break is coming, you know, and all of this is happening. This, I can easily, easily go to Sports Center. I can easily go to all the sports apps that I've tried to delete from my phone. Instead of going right to the Word, first thing, I have to purpose in my heart that I don't do that. We can be so easily distracted. And then one thing leads to another, Right? But God's word leads to even greater joy, greater depths, doesn't it? Don't you just love it when you open up this black and white portrait of a king who's a friend of ours, and then we can just see, we can just see it revealed to us? I have this picture in, in our bedroom that we've had for years, and it's this father, he's sitting on the couch, and he has the Bible open in front of him, and he has the kids and his dogs all around him, and then behind him, are these, these images of the ark being carried across into the promised land. Uh, the lion from the tribe of Judah, uh, Goliath, and David slaying Goliath. All these images, and they're just illuminated. It's just a wonderful little print, but it's beautiful. And that's, that's how it should be for us when we open God's word. It should just illuminate for us the truths of his word. And one thing leads to the other, Right? The cross, it goes back in time to, I see, I see the lamb, I see, I see the altar, but where is the lamb? Well, God himself will provide the lamb. So we see all these images and these pictures. Matt and Tony had shared earlier that our marriages are a picture of the marriage supper of the lamb, our relationship with Christ. But there's going to be some hard things that we're going to talk about tonight. Because the topic that we've had in this study going through Proverbs is the problem of. The problem of money, the problem of friends, the problem of fools or foolishness, fools, the problem of marriage. But don't let me get ahead of myself here. I haven't done this in a while, so I've got I to gotta rely on my notes here, probably more than I need to. So tonight's topic, the problem of marriage, has been a difficult one for me to wrap my heart and mind around. And I'm aware that for many of you sitting here, it's a hard topic. Marriages have been difficult for you. Maybe they're in the midst of a marriage that's not doing well. Maybe you're coming out of a divorce. Maybe you have been divorced. Maybe you got married and were unequally yoked as a young Christian. Maybe you experience abuse, neglect. Maybe you were abandoned. I understand, and I'm so sorry. But Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He has a whole new life for you in him. This is that beautiful picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb that we're all going to be able to enjoy as the bride of Christ. And we're going to be spotless, spotless and unblemished washed clean by the washing of the word. But life is tough. Life is hard, but God is good. People hurt people. It's a fallen world. Relations are not how God intended them to be. 
There's too much of self involved. We're going to be getting into that. Marsha and I have been married for 40 years. It, is, it has and still can be filled with much difficulty. Is our marriage on the rocks? Or are we on the rock? And that's what we want to look at tonight. That's the goal for tonight. Having our marriage on the rock, on a firm foundation. Just like that great hymn written in the 1800s, my hope is built on nothing less. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground, sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So we're going to begin tonight with the heart. And isn't that where the problems typically, usually issue from, is our hearts. We can't trust our heart. It's deceptively wicked, but we're called to guard our hearts. Guard your hearts, Proverbs 4.23. Guard your hearts above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Luke 6.45. The good man, the good man brings things out of the good treasure of his heart. The evil man brings evil things of the evil treasure of his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's a contrast we see throughout the word, isn't it? In Adam, in Christ, in darkness, in light. The good man, the evil man. Walking in light, walking in darkness. In this world, out of this world. Fruit of the spirit, works of the flesh. And we can continue on in these contrasts these tensions that are found throughout God's word. Remember that in our marriage, there is an enemy seeking to destroy you, destroy us. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. The father of lies, the great counterfeiter. Mike Booth, it was a blessing having him here from Nicaragua a couple of weeks ago, and he spoke on the counterfeiter, the father of lies. And it reminded me of when I had a small retail business here in Oceanside. And it was so true, it brought back memories. This is 15, 20 years ago, I guess. And as I would get new employees, I'd have them spend time at the register. And there'd be, from time to time, we'd get counterfeit $20 bills. It, it would happen. It, it runs through the city all the time, at least once a year, every couple of years. And it would typically be 20s. So I'd have them stand at the register, and I would tell them, Get to know this money. Get to know how it looks, feels, smells, all of it. Tactile, visually, all of it. Get to, know, get to know your money. Well, isn't that like us? We need to get to know who God is. Mike said the real deal. He's the real deal, not the counterfeit. We, and the only way we can do that is what? By spending time in his word, spending time with one another, developing our marriage relationship, building it on the rock. The problem with marriage, the problem with marriage (laughs) is when we're not trusting in God, when we're not devoted to God. That's the problem of marriage. Therein lies the problem of marriage, and it stems from our hearts. In the David Hawking book, which we are using as a guide, he gives a story of a man not guarding his heart, King Solomon. David Hawking wrote that God had told Solomon that if he wanted to be a successful king, he needed to guard three areas of his life. Horses, which is armament, military might, power, money, and wives. Because if he became too consumed with any of those or all of those, not only would it corrupt his own heart, it would corrupt the hearts and minds of the people that lived in Israel. So in 1 Kings 11, 11, verse 4 through 8, we're going to see one of the areas that tripped Solomon up, and it was women. It was, he had 700 wives. He had another 400 or something crazy uh, concubines. I can barely handle one. For it came to pass, 1 Kings 11, 4 through 8, for it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wise turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of Zidonans, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, 
And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Continuing in verse 7, then, this wasn't enough, not only did evil in the sight of the Lord brought in these false gods that were an abomination, that's pretty serious, isn't it? Then Solomon built high places, altars, secret places of sacrifice for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hills that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. We read in verse 4 that Solomon turned his heart and went after other gods. His heart was not with the Lord his God. This is the problem with marriage. When our hearts are not devoted and focused on the things of God. God had warned Solomon to be careful in these three areas. But Solomon did what Solomon wanted to do and got tripped up. We read that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Remember we talked earlier that he did not end his life well. God took, removed the throne from him. He was stripped. And that's what God will do to us, won't he? He will strip us. He will, he will strip us down to bare bones, to the, to the basics, down to the foundational truths of who he is. We don't want to go through that. No one wants to be pruned. No one wants to be beat upon. But this is what God will do sometimes, even in our marriages. I'm not a big fisherman. Some of you here are. So you know the power and how effective the right lure can be when fishing for a specific fish, right? The right lure, they'll hit on it, right? And they'll take it hook, line, and sinker. And don't we have an enemy that's just as deceptive and just as tricky? He knows the right lure to cast out. And how many of us have just taken it hook, line, and sinker? Just hitting it hard. In verse 6, we read that Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did his father. The danger, the tragedy, is the progression, the downward spiral that we see in the later years of Solomon's life. We don't need to revisit that. It didn't end well for him. He, these gods that he brought in were abomination. But the question I have is, what are we bringing into our homes? Oh, well, we may not be bringing in uh, gods that are an abomination, uh, we may not be sacrificing despicable sacrifices, in our, but what are we bringing into our lives? What are we bringing into our home? What idols are we setting up in our lives, in our home? What, what gods are we creating in our own lives? Oh, we may not have a little cabinet on the side of our bedroom wall with these little idols and gods, but we have them. What are we bringing into our home? An idol is what? Anything that comes between us and God, that's what an idol is. This is what can divert our attention from the things of God. We can be off just a little bit, but we could miss it, can't we? It would be like if you and I were on a stand-up paddleboard or whatever, and we went out to Catalina Island, and, and we were only off, a, or in a boat, probably better in a boat, and, and we were only off one degree. Well, we'd see it, and we could steer our course and correct our course and get back over there. But let's say we're going to Hawaii and we were one degree off. Wow. We'd be lost at sea. We'd be out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. God has to be our compass. He's our true north. He's our azimuths. He has, he has to be that center of our lives. Have you ever heard of the phrase, dove eyes? Interesting thing about doves is that they have singular vision. In other words, they can only focus on one thing at a time. Dove eyes. Solomon wrote of dove eyes. He said, my bride has dove eyes for me in the Song of Solomon, Song of Songs. I wonder if that's how Jesus views us. Do we have only eyes for him? Do we have a singular focus on the things of God? Or, or is our attention diverted? Are we, are we like a weather vane being blown about? 
Isn't that what Paul wrote? That, you know, we've been, we've been blown off course. The enemy is just blowing us off course, and we're like a weather vane. We're just kind of waffling out there, going wherever the wind of doctrine would go. It's like a lot of people in life today, directionless. God wants to keep us focused on the things of him in our marriage. That's the problem with our marriages. We're, we're too scattered. We're too, we're too all over the place. Narcissism is a fairly popular term today. Why? Why is that such a popular term today? Because many of us are self-seeking, self-gratifying, narcissistic fools. Ask my wife. She's called me a narcissist more than once. It's just like, ah. We don't have to look very far, do we? We can see how we can serve self. The new altar of self. We can gratify ourselves. We can placate ourselves. Our marriage becomes a problem when it's about us. When it's not about him, when it's not about our spouse. Francis Chan, in his book, Marriage in the Light of Eternity, wrote, we can't cure our narcissism by trying to ignore ourselves. The solution is to stare at God. Isn't that great? The solution is to stare at God. When we actually stare at him, everything else fades into its proper place. Yes, the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. True that, right? I've decided to follow Jesus. Though some may fall, yet I will follow. How many marriages do we know, are we familiar with, that are no longer following after the things of God, that have fallen by the wayside? How many people do we know, period, that have drifted from the things of God, that slow drift? Sometimes that drift isn't sinful, it's just innocent in the sense that we're involved with family, we're involved with work, we're involved with this, that, and the other, but it's that slow drift, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, where am I? Like, right now there's a pretty strong current. There's a pretty strong swell coming in, and it's it's pretty strong current pulling from south to north, and it'd be like if you were to go out there and you weren't paying attention, it would be like, wow, how did I end up at the harbor? Where's my kid? Where's my towel? Where's, yeah. It's, it, can happen, it can happen so innocently and so insidiously that we're not aware of it. It's that drift in our lives. We can't cure our narcissism by trying to ignore ourselves. The solution is to stare at God. When we actually stare at him, everything else falls into place. So what is the resource we have to not be narcissistic and self-serving in our marriage? It's the power of God's spirit. It's that three-strand cord in our marriage, isn't it, that we read about in Ecclesiastes, that three-strand cord that's not easily broken. Not only is it not easily broken, it binds it together, strengthens it. That's the Holy Spirit. For me and my wife in our marriage, it isn't me that's bound us together and kept us from breaking. It's only been the power of the Holy Spirit. We've had difficulty in our marriage. Early on, I was just a mess. I was just self-serving, wanting to do what I wanted to do. I got married a little bit later in life. It was all about me and my needs and my wants. I ended up leaving my wife for six months or whatever it was. By the grace of God, we came back, we reconciled, we re God restored our marriage, and we started a beautiful family shortly thereafter. That was early in our marriage. Even since then, there's been times in my marriage, it's like, man, what is this all about? What am I doing wrong? What do I need to do? But it's when my heart is right with God, that's when the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. That's when the joy of the Lord will, will be manifested in your marriages. It may seem like your marriage is dead now. It may seem like it's on life support. Paul in Ephesians has said, you were once dead. 
is what he's done for us. You were dead. You were corpses. If you're here in Christ Jesus and you're alive in Christ, you were once dead. You were just a stinking, rotten corpse. That's who we were. But by but God, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love for us, raised us from the dead. He can do the same in our marriages, your marriage, your life, creating you a new heart, a new way to be human, a new way to, to do this together. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Amen? Despite all these things, we have overwhelming victory in Christ who loves us. We can't protect our marriages through more date nights, more vacations, or more counseling. These are great. These are great for marriages, good things to do. But we have to see that it has to be so much more in our marriage for it not to be a problem. We need him to revive us, revive our marriages, so that we are empowered to walk in victory, to be salt and light in a world where marriage is being redefined, isn't it? The whole marriage covenant is being redefined. Family life is being redefined. Society is being redefined. Our culture is being redefined. But on the solid rock I stand, all else is sinking sand. Let's start at the beginning, Genesis 2, 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's from the King James Version. I like that word cleave. I think it's a powerful, descriptive word, cleave. It's poetic, isn't it? it, it, it to me, it gives me the image of holding on to a, to a scrub brush as I'm sliding down a sandstone cliff and I'm holding on to dear life. Cleave, cling, adhere to, stuck to, supernaturally made one through the spirit and the power of God. Cleaving, leaving and cleaving, right? You've heard that expression, leaving and cleaving. Other translations render leave and cleave as leave and be united, leave and be joined, and leave and hold fast. But what does it mean to leave and cleave? To cleave means to adhere, to stick to, to join with. It is a unique joining of two people into one supernatural work of God. The leave and cleave in marriage is also a picture of the relationship God wants us to have with him. He wants us to hold on to him for dear life, right? Deuteronomy 13.4 in the King James again. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. That's what we're called to do. Cleaving unto him, holding on to him for our very lives and the life of our spouse holding on to one another as he's holding on to us and we're holding on to him. A big group hug. It means we leave all other gods, whatever form they may take. That's what cleaving means and leaving. Leaving all other gods, whatever form they may take, and joining to him. Cleaving alone to him as our God. We cleave to him as we read his word and submit to his authority. Relying on his Holy Spirit. That's the only way we can cleave. That's our resource to cleave to him. Paul writes to husbands in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, she might be holy and without blemish. Then, as we follow him closely, we find that his instructions to leave father and mother and those useful lusts, those things that have our attention, and once we leave those behind and cleave to him, we discover contentment and peace in our marriage. 
Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. This is it. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? God takes his design for marriage very seriously. Leaving and cleaving is God's plan for those who marry. When we follow God's plan, we are never lacking. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Oh, we may not have the finances, the material wealth. We may not have what the world thinks we should have, but we have the unsearchable riches of Christ, don't we? The unsearchable riches of his love, his grace, his mercy, his kindness, his love for us. Those are the things of eternity that will last, aren't they? Everything else we're going to leave behind. I think someone we were talking about money, maybe Tony asked Rockefeller's accountant after Rockefeller died, who at the time was the wealthiest man maybe in the world, well, how much did he leave behind? Well, he left it all. Yeah. Everything else we can, we can as they say, we can mail forward, right? Or whatever that expression is. We can, we can have that eternal weight of glory. We can pass that along to, our, to the future generations, declaring to the generations that come the psalmist wrote, the glories, the riches of who God is. That's our heritage, parents, grandparents. Pay it forward. Yes, thank you. So practically, how does this take place in our marriage? Practically speaking, how do we eliminate the problem of marriage when our hearts aren't right with God? Well, it means we do not quit when things are not going right. It includes talking things out and praying things through. Being patient as you trust God to work in both of your hearts, having tender hearts to receive. Being willing to admit when you're wrong, asking for forgiveness. God gives grace to the humble, but resist the proud. The problems in my marriages is been when I'm very proudful in heart and I won't ask for forgiveness. Well, I won't say I'm sorry. How can she forgive me if I'm not asking for forgiveness? But it's pride. He resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. There's not much he can do in my life or any of our lives when we're proud in spirit, right? When we're proudful, hard-hearted, there's not much he can do. He'll find someone else that'll have a tender heart and a soft heart that he can use as a message for his voice to speak to a lost and dying world, to speak to other couples whose marriage is on life support. He'll use other people. He'll still love us. We'll, We'll still have eternity with him, but he wants to use us in a powerful way here, doesn't he? He wants to use us as salt and light. Jesus told his disciples, you are now the light of the world. I am the light of the world, he said, in those great I am statements. But he said, you are the light of the world. And then he said, you are the salt of the earth. He never said, I am the salt of the earth, too. He said, you are the salt of the earth. So we have responsibility, don't we, as Christians, to be salt, to be light, to be have dove eyes for the things of Jesus, to be singularly focused on the things of him. Seeking God's wisdom. If you're lacking wisdom and direction in your marriage, seek godly wisdom. And there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors, aren't there? If you're struggling in your marriage, if your marriage is on the rocks and not on the rock, then get together with a couple. Have coffee. Sit down. Pray. Say, I I need prayer. And I can guarantee you that if it's a couple that God has drawn you to, then they're going to say, yes, let's pray. For where two or more are gathered in his name, he is there in your midst. And there's wisdom in the multitude of counselors. Without faith, without God's wisdom, we can be lost at sea. Our marriage is driven by the wind, right? We can find ourselves way off course, as we mentioned earlier in danger of being shipwrecked, castaways, being blown about by the enemy of our souls. There's also an aspect of marriage that we can overlook because of the overwhelming pressures and stress to keep our marriages intact, to keep it on life support. It's a far bigger and beautiful picture of our ultimate hope and our eternal home. 
Let's look at Genesis 2.24 as referenced by Paul in Ephesians 5.31. I'll read it for us. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. Wow. When God wanted to relate himself to mankind, he chose a couple. Isn't that amazing? When God wanted to relate to mankind in his creation, he chose a couple. Hmm. It's interesting that of all the pictures God could have used, a mighty storm, an earthquake, a king and servants, a father and son, he chose instead to start with a picture of marriage. So what does it mean, this mystery is profound? How does Genesis 2 actually refer to Christ in the church, especially when neither Christ nor the church are mentioned in Genesis 2? God is giving us a picture. Our marriages are supposed to be living pictures, representations of God's love to the world, which is in Jesus. We are representatives of his love, of who he is to the world as a married couple. Our marriages speak for something deeper than themselves. They speak as a representation of Jesus' love for the world. This picture continues on with the people of Israel. And then ultimately, as we spoke on earlier, some of these men, in the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb, where the church is pictured as the bride of Christ. That's our hope, isn't it? That's the good news, that we're going to be able to sup with our Lord. Jesus, on that night he was betrayed and had that last supper, he goes, I have longed to do this with you, and I won't be able to do it again until we're in heaven together. And we're going to be there at the marriage supper of the Lamb, breaking bread together, having communion at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19.9, and the angel said to John, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Lamb. John calls the Savior of the world the Lamb many times throughout the book of Revelation. He writes constantly about the Lamb, actually. The Lamb in the midst of the throne. The Lamb leading his people to living fountains of water. And now the angel tells him to write about the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is no marriage without a bridegroom, right? There is no marriage of the church, which is the bride of Christ, without the appearance of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 11.2, Paul wrote, For I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband. Paul describes the Corinthians as betrothed, engaged to Christ. Betrothed to Christ, engaged to Christ, but not yet with him. That's us. We're engaged to Christ, who are betrothed to him, but not yet with him. It was a godly jealousy to present the Corinthians as a pure bride. This godly jealousy for us to be set apart, sanctified, should be the overriding desire in all our hearts for ourselves and for our marriages, that we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus together. We should, desire, we should desire Christ to sanctify us in our marriages completely, setting us apart from this world and the sin which so easily ensnares us. As we are in him, as our marriages are in Christ, the abundant life that Jesus promised is ours to lay hold of. The thief comes only to kill, rob, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you may have life, and this for our marriages and have it more abundantly. I will close with this verse verse from Revelation 19. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of many peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And the bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, John speaking, write this, 
Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Let's pray. Jesus, we have been granted as your bride, your church, to be clothed. This is how you see us, as pure, as spotless, clothed in fine linen. Heavenly Father, I pray for my marriage. I pray for the marriages that are represented here that their lives together would be held together by that three-strand cord, which is you, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit, binding them together, not easily torn asunder, that they would be able to walk in victory together, putting off the deeds of the flesh, putting off the things of this world, and putting on you, clothing themselves in you, Jesus. It's a problem in our marriage when our eyes aren't set upon the things of you and your kingdom. We want your kingdom come, your will to be done in our lives, in our marriages. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.